It was just a week to the day since Mr. Martin had decided to rub out Mrs. Eugene Barrows. The term rub out pleased him, because it suggested nothing more than the correction of an error. In this case, an error of Mr. Fitwiler. Mr. Martin had spent each night of the past week working out his plan and examining it. As he walked home now, he went over it again. For the hundredth time, he resented the element of imprecision, the margin of guesswork that entered into the business. The project, as he had worked it out, was casual and bold. The risks were considerable. Something might go wrong anywhere along the line, and therein lay the cunning of his scheme. No one would ever see it in the cautious, painstaking hand of Erwin Martin, head of the filing department at FNS, of whom Mr. Fitwiler had once said, Man is fallible, but Martin isn't. No one would see his hand, that is, unless it were caught in the act. For almost two years now, Mrs. Barrows baited him, in the halls, in the elevator, even in his own office, into which she romped now and then like a circus horse. She was constantly shouting these silly questions at him. I listen to Oscar out of the dish. Are you sitting in the cat bird So are you scraping down the bottom of the pickle barrel? She must be a Dodgers fan. Red Barber announces the Dodgers games over the radio and he uses those expressions. Picking them up down south, tearing up the pea patch, met a man on a rampage. Sitting in the catbird seat meant sitting pretty, like a batter with three balls and no strikes on him. You know, so she probably meant it like that. Her pickaxe was on the upswing, poised for the first blow. It had not come yet. He had received no blue memo from the enchanted Mr. Fitwiler, bearing nonsensical instructions deriving from the obscene woman. But there was no doubt in Mr. Martin's mind that one would be forthcoming. He must act quickly. Mr. Fitwiler. Hey. Mr. Munson's department has been a little disrupted lately. Perhaps we should resume the old system. Certainly not. I have the greatest confidence in Mrs. Barrow's ideas. They're like a fine salsa, just needing a little extra seasoning. That's all. She had begun to wander about the office, taking it in with her great popping <coughs> eyes. Are you scraping around the bottom of the pickle barrel? Do you really need all these filing cabinets? Well, each of these files plays an indispensable role here at the system of FNS. Alright, well, don't tear up the pea patch. Well, you sure have some fine scrap in here. Mr. Martin could no longer doubt that the finger was on his beloved department. Take a look at Mr. Martin, our most efficient worker, neither smokes nor drinks. The results speak for themselves. Nice shirt, by the way, Art. Thank you. It's a nice shirt you got, by the way, too. Mr. Martin was still thinking about that red-letter day as he walked over to the local diner on 2nd Avenue near Spring Street. He got there, as he always did, 
at 8 o'clock. He finished his dinner and the financial page of the Times at a quarter to nine, as he always did. It was his custom after dinner to take a walk. This time, he walked down 3rd Avenue at a casual pace. His glove hands felt moist and warm, his forehead cold. He transferred the camels from his overcoat to a jacket pocket. He wondered, as he did so, if they did not represent an unnecessary note of strain. Mrs. Barrows smoked only Lucky's. It was his idea to puff a few puffs on a camel. After the rubbing out, stub it out in the ashtray, holding her lipstick-stained luckies, and thus drag a small red herring across the trial. Perhaps it was not a good idea. It would take time. He might even choke, too loudly. As he walked along, Mr. Martin realized that he would not get there before 9.30. He had considered walking north, on 2nd Avenue from the diner to a point from which it would take him until 10 o'clock to reach the house. At that hour, people were less likely to be coming in or going out, but the procedure would have made an awkward loop in the straight thread of his casualness, and he abandoned it. For God's sakes, look who's here! Okay, good job. Yes, yes. Hey, let me help you with your coat. No, no, no. I'll put it there. Your scarf and shoes, too. You're in a lady's house. I was just, just passing by and I recognized. Is anybody here? No, we're all alone. Then why is a sheep? Are you okay? What's got over you? I'll make you a toddy. Second toad will be alright. But say, you don't drink, do you? Uh, Scotch and soda will be all right. He looked quickly around the room for a weapon. He had counted on finding one there. Hey, are you tearing up the pea patch? For heaven's sake, take off the shoes. I, I always wear them in the house. Come over here, you odd little man. Here's nuts to that old windbag Fitwiler. Really, Mr. Martin? Are you insulting our employer? I prepared a bomb, which will blow that old goat higher than hell. Do you do dope or something? Heroin. I'll be coked to the gills when I blow that old buzzer off. Be all of that. You need to leave at once. Not a word about this. I'm sitting in the catbird seat. I'm reporting you to Mr. Fitwiler now. If you turn into the police, it's only what you deserve. I beg your pardon? Ugh. What's with that devil now? Mr. Fitwiler, sir? Ah, uh, Mr. Martin. If I remember correctly, you have been with us for more than 20 years now. 22, sir. 22. And in that time, your work and uh, your manner has been exemplary. I trust so, sir. <laughs> from what am I, from what I understand, you've never taken a drink or ever had a cigarette in your entire life. That's correct, sir. Okay then. Can you please tell me then exactly what you did last night when you left the office, please, Mr. Martin? Uh, certainly, sir. I uh, I walked home. Then I went to Clifton's for dinner, sir. I walked home again. Then I went home early, sir. I read a magazine for a while, went to bed early, and I was asleep before 11, sir. 
Oh, yes. Mrs. Barrels. Mrs. Barrels has worked hard, Martin. Very hard. It grieves me to report that she has suffered a severe breakdown. It has taken the form of a persecution complex accompanied by distressing hallucinations. I am very sorry, sir. It is the nature of these psychological diseases to fix upon the least likely persons, the most innocent at times, for the persecution. These matters are not for the lay mind to grasp, Mr. Martin. I just had my psychiatrist, Dr. Fitch, on the phone to see what he had to say about this. He would not, of course, commit to any rational decisions, but his generalizations confirm my suspicions. I suggested to Miss Barrows yesterday, after her story, to visit with Dr. Fitch. And I regret to inform you that she left in a goddamn rage. You may not know Mr. Barham, but Mrs. Barrels had planned a, rec a reorganization of your department subject to my approval. Of course, only with my approval. This brought you, rather than anyone else, to her mind. But again, that is a phenomenon for Dr. Fitch and not for us. So, Mr. Martin, I am afraid Mrs. Burrell's usefulness here is at an end. I am dreadfully sorry, sir. Is this little rat denying it? He can't get away with this. He was drinking and smoking at my apartment, and he said he was going to blow you up when he got co coked up on heroin. If you weren't such a drab, ordinary little man, I think you planned it all. Sticking your tongue out at me saying you're sitting in the catbird seat. Because you thought no one would believe me. My God, it was perfect. Can't you see he's tricked us? You little fool? Can't you see his little game? Joey, get your ass in here right now. This, I swear, that's what happened. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are you Take Mrs. Brown's house, Roberts. You're going to go with them. Get out of here. Get her out of here. Action. Whatever you want to do. The hell's not that devil now? <laughs> Stick your tongue out at me, sing your face. <laughs>